please welcome Tony Viscre. Good morning. The legendary fountain of youth. It brings youth to those who drink its water or bathe in it, such as this painting from the 16th century shows. But really, every civilization, every culture was dreaming of rejuvenation and living forever. And even today, people are fascinated by Dracula and stories about um, uh, vampires and similar things. But um, there might actually be something to this. A small but growing number of studies, in mice at least, suggests that to some extent it might be possible to rejuvenate tissues. This started initially with Tom Rando at Stanford University when he used a model called parabiosis in which two animals share a circulation. So he put a young and an old mouse together, and what he could show that the old mouse could rejuvenate the muscle. The old muscle stem cells got reactivated and could repair this old muscle again. This was later confirmed by Amy Wagers, and others then showed similar effects of young blood in the pancreas, the liver, and the heart. But really, I think what is most exciting and relevant for us here, four different groups have now shown that this may even apply to the brain. And it might be possible to rejuvenate or at least halt and reverse some of the effects of aging. Not completely restore youth to the brain, but some of the effects were, be, were able to be reversed. And these are the groups that you see listed here in close collaboration with the Randall Lab or the Wagers Lab. But let's take a step back first. As we get older, most of the cognitive functions are actually quite well preserved, as you can see here. So up to age 50 or 60, cognitive function is preserved. So you all fine here in the audience. But then what happens? Every aspect of cognition, including spatial orientation, numerical ability, verbal ability, they all go down as we get 70, 80, 90 years old. We know that the connections between neurons, called the synapses, start to disappear in the aging brain. Neurons don't function as well they start losing their capacity to communicate with each other. Eventually, they die, the brain shrinks, and diseases such as Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases develop. But we really don't understand what specifically happens. And I think the key problem, and this was discussed yesterday and the day before, is that we have no way of looking at molecular changes in the brain of a living person. We can look at function, we can do memory tests with people, we can look at the structure with MRI, we can measure glucose metabolism, so uh, sugar consumption, we can look at oxygen consumption, but we cannot look at what changes at the molecular level as a person gets older or gets Alzheimer's disease or another type of disease. We have to wait until that person dies, and then we look sort of at what happened during their lifetime. So there's no way to study molecules in living people. So how could you get around this? The approach we took, and, and others have done that before, is to make the argument that the brain is actually connected to the rest of the body. So if the body ages, the brain ages. If the brain ages or gets sick, other parts of the body may show reactions to that. So if this is true, then maybe we can study instead of the brain, we can study something else in the body. And probably the organ or the tissue that is most relevant in this context is the blood. The blood is the tissue that connects all the different organs. It, of course, carries cells that transport oxygen or fight uh, diseases such as in inflammatory, infectious diseases, but it also serves as a medium to communicate between cells and between different tissues. And this is achieved by proteins, many of which are, ve are well studied, that communicate information from one cell to another. These are proteins such as growth factors, cytokines, chemokines. These proteins are well known to carry information from one cell type to another within an organ or across different organs. 
So what we decided to do is look at hundreds of these proteins. So really to try to understand the language of our body, if you will, to listen into the communication between different cells and between different organs. And what we found is that if we look at many of these, that by and large, factors that are associated with growth, with repair, sort of with beneficial effects, they decrease as we get older, while factors involved in inflammation increase. So there's a an, an uh, imbalance as we get older that many of these factors change. So that also means that our body lives in a very different environment as we get older. And these are, of course, only correlates of aging. They don't tell us whether these changes have anything to do with the brain or anything else in our body. At this point, they're just correlates. So how can we understand whether they actually do something to the brain? And this is where the question, the model comes in again that, that Tom Rand that I mentioned to you and others have started to use to try to understand the systemic environment and how it impacts other organs, including the brain. So in this model called parabiosis, two animals are joined at their flanks and their blood vessel join, similar to Siamese twins. And this allows us now to ask the question, how does the young systemic environment, how does the young blood affect the old brain and vice versa? We use for an old mouse, we use an equivalent of maybe a 65-year-old person. The young mice are three months of age, similar to a 20-year-old person. And what we found quite remarkably, is that many different aspects we study, in fact, all the things that we've looked at so far, look like they are younger again in an old mouse, as if they were rejuvenated. So we see more stem cell activity. Elena Cataneo showed you previously how stem cells are important in the brain. We can reactivate these cells in the old brain. We see increased activity in neurons. We see structural changes and we see expression of genes that we know are involved in memory formation, so-called uh, immediate early genes. And this was done with this parabiosis model. But this model did not allow us to test whether there's actually a functional benefit. Can we increase the memory capacity, for example, of these mice. Now, mice, as they get old, they have the same problem we do. We just don't care much about it, I guess. But they, 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 they forget where they borrowed their cheese, maybe. Or they can't remember their, their, um, their uh, cage mates. So we can take advantage of this and, and develop specific tests to measure this memory function. But, as I said, the parabiosis model is not suitable to really test that. So we came up with another way to test this, uh, because we noticed that in the parabiosis model, the cells from the blood do actually not enter the brain. So this made us conclude that most likely it's soluble factors that are responsible for the effects. I mentioned to you before that we measured hundreds of these soluble factors, and we know they're changing with age. So this suggested to us that maybe these factors directly communicate with the brain. And so the logical thing to do is to take the blood from young mice, and we got rid of the cells, and so we're left with what is called plasma. This is the soluble fraction of blood. It's a yellowish uh, liquid um, called plasma. So we could inject this plasma over several weeks into young or old mice, and as controls, we can in, in, inject saline or old plasma. And these were really studies that were uh, done in my lab by a very talented student, uh, Saul Vileda, who has now his own lab and has successfully taken this to the next level. But would this even work? I told you now about mice and about mouse plasma, but would this work with human plasma? Could we take plasma from young people and from old people and see different effects. Could young plasma actually restore cognitive function and rejuvenate a mouse brain? And to try to do that, Joseph Castellano, a fellow in my lab, and I'm showing you now our unpublished data, had the idea to not only use young plasma, but he went for the youngest possible, so neonates uh, that have just been born, we took the, uh, the umbilical cord, took the plasma out, and so we have basically zero-year-old plasma. 
When we looked at the different proteins, we actually found that this type of plasma had the highest levels of growth factor activity. So he injected saline as a control or umbilical cord plasma into mice, and what he could show that you see on the left-hand side that the cord plasma activated neurons. We use a surrogate marker here, an immediate early gene called CFOS, that lights up these neurons in red, as you can see, but saline or old plasma did not have this effect, and you see, can see the quantification of these results in the graph. So what about cognitive function? An old mouse, or actually any mouse, does not like the spotlight, such as I'm standing here. So they want to hide. And in this test called the Barnes maze, this is a table that has a lot of holes in it. And one hole, the one that pointed by the arrow, leads to a tube underneath the table that is dark. And so the mice like to hide in this tube. And so we train them to use the spatial cues around this maze and make a memory map so that they can remember where this hole is. We train them several times per day over four days and the young mouse would learn this task. But these old mice don't learn it. As you can see here, this mouse is more or less clueless. It is just looking into every hole and actually took it more than a minute to eventually find the hole. It was not able to create a spatial map. But what happens if we look at a mouse that is treated with young plasma, human plasma? This mouse is interesting. It actually pauses initially, and it's almost as it looks around, where am I? And then it walks right to the hole and disappears. So what happened here? This is the same age mouse that I showed you before. It's a different mouse, but the same age. It was treated for three weeks with young plasma. So this suggests that there is something not just in mouse, young mouse plasma, but in human plasma that can regenerate or rejuvenate the brain. It can reactivate processes in this brain that make it function again like a younger mouse, not like a newborn, like a two-month-old mouse, but it clearly performs better. So what are the factors that are responsible for this? We think there's many factors and this is shared by other people in the field. There's not just one magic factor. So to try to find some of these factors, what Joseph did is he looked at changes of these hundreds of proteins with normal aging in mice and in humans, and then also in the parabiosis model. And he came up with a ranked list of factors. He used a number of different tests to screen for the activity of these factors, and then finally tested them in mice. And the top factor that he came up with was called colony stimulating factor 2, or CSF2. And you can see here in a number of humans, newborn, neonatal plasma, young people around 20 years of age, or older people, 65 and older. You can see how this factor goes down as people get older. So this is a growth factor, a trophic factor, actually for immune cells. It's a factor that is used to produce new types of immune cells, and it goes down as we get older. I'm curious about these two individuals, the older individuals who have high levels. Are they going to live until 100 years of age? We don't know. They're still all alive. So what Joseph found is that injecting just four doses of CSF2 into the periphery, not into the brain, but into the belly, lead to an increase in activation of neurons, and moreover, it also improved cognitive function. So this factor was able to activate processes in the brain that allow them to store now the spatial information again. And you can see here, this is again a Barnes maze, the black dots are mice, old mice injected with vehicle, and they actually don't learn anything. They don't see any significant improvement over these four days of trials. But you see the, mon the ones injected with CSF2 already on the third day, in the third trial, they clearly learn the task and they find the hole, the escape hole. And then on the fourth day, they do really well. So the exciting thing about this is this factor is almost 
it, it, it validates the approach that we've taken. Because this factor has been discovered completely independently based on the assumption or the idea that immune functions are changed in Alzheimer's disease and that they might be beneficial. Huntington Potter uh, in 2010 showed that if he injected these factors in a mouse model for Alzheimer's disease, these mice did better and it re reduced actually the pathology. So here we found the same factor completely independently and showing that with aging, this factor goes down and if you replenish it in an old mouse, you can reactivate their brain function. This, this drug is actually used in people after bone marrow transplantation uh, if they had cancer. And is currently in a phase two uh, study in Alzheimer's disease. So to conclude, what we show is that the old mouse and its brain in particular are not set in stone. It's not a brick that cannot be changed. It's malleable. It can be changed, it can be regenerated and rejuvenated. This is, of course, still in mice, but we have hopes that similar processes could be activated potentially in the human brain. And young human plasma contains factors that in part reverse aging processes. And CSF2 is an example of such a factor. Thank you very much.